to know that we had a health message, but I honestly never realized how important this message is to the, um, let's say, the success of uh, the church's work for us individually and then also in evangelistic uh, outreaches. And we'll see some of this. I wanted just to preface the slides, though, with just a couple of statements. And the first place that I read this was in a little book called Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, talking about how God is the author of two laws. Um, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and because the world has set aside those uh, through the working of the man of sin, God is not going to punish this world without bringing a message to the world to give them an opportunity to make a switch, okay, to change their leaders and to get back to the law of God. Well, another set of laws that God gives us is natural law. He calls it natural laws. And that God wants us to benefit from these laws that God created us under as far as the working of these bodies. And just recently, I learned this. We were out doing a, a seminar on mental health. And as I was studying for this, through different um, uh, scriptures and inspired writings, God makes it clear that the laws that he created this whole world under are laws that affect our bodies. The movement of the sun, the stars, okay, all the planet systems, the growth of you know, the plants, the trees, that these laws are the same laws that govern our bodies. And when we operate our bodies by his grace under the divine laws, he calls the natural laws, not only will we be, can he keep us healthy, but also it has an effect upon our minds. And here is the relationship between the mind and the body and the body and the mind. You may recall the statement that wherever you see a sick body, you're gonna see a sick mind that nine-tenths of all diseases begins here by, in the mind, the way people are encouraged to think. And you know, you think of all the negative emotions that are in this world, fear, you know, depression, hopelessness, uh, anger, frustration, um, resentment, uh, unforgiveness. All of these are part of sin. They were never intended for us to know these things but they have an effect on our body, and this is where God is wanting us to give these to the Lord so we can be cleansed and made pure for our bodies, our minds, and for uh, the work that God wants us to do. So that's just a little preference, pref, um, preface, and you'll see that in what it cost God to redeem us from violation also of natural law, which leads to violation of the moral law. You can't divorce them. And that's why the health message has got to go with the three angels message. It's not the body, but it's the right arm that goes before, opens the door, serves the church, and it serves us as well. So we'll see that hopefully as we look at a few of these inspired statements of scripture and so forth. So let's begin with a word of prayer, can we? Um, Father in heaven, once again, we are coming simply as your children to learn of God. We need the teacher, the divine teacher, for we've each received that holy unction. We need the Holy Spirit to impress our minds with the truth as it is in Jesus. And we know that thy word is truth. All of thy commandments are righteousness. Thy testimonies are true. They will be forever. 
So please help us, Lord, to appreciate these divine precepts and not only to understand them, but to practice them so that we can speak the truth with the power that will be given us by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, here is this statement about the close sympathy that exists between the physical and the moral nature. And God even explains it further is that there are various functions of the mind. He calls them organs of the mind. And that the mind is to be the citadel of the body and God communicates with us through the Holy Spirit, through this mind. And so it will always be Satan's object to disorder the mind, okay, through the body. And that's why so many of our temptations are coming to us through the flesh. And Satan is trying to get control of our minds through the operation of the uh, physical body, and we'll see that as we go through. So remember that one affects the other and vice versa. They're very, um, that's a very important statement. Paul's testimony, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. And that goes with the statement that temperance is the foundation of every other grace that God will give to humanity is temperance in all things. And then in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul recognized this. It was revealed to Paul, and he says, I must keep my body under. I must bring it into subjection to what? The higher powers, okay? You know, the judgment, the will, okay, the purposing. Um, th those are the higher powers of the mind. Now, if we, what? Oh, excuse me. And then if we don't and we allow our minds to be diverted into other channels, then especially in terms of some of the dietary preferences that people have, you may recall the term animalism. That's what God uses to describe when the lower powers and passions and lust are above now the higher powers that God intended us to operate from. The, the, the spiritual nature of man as it's directed by God. Love and kindness and um, you know, the helpfulness, all of those positive emotions, brotherly kindness, love, all of that. That is to be the higher powers, judgment, will. And when the other powers are allowed to have reign, they will disorder the whole person, not just the physical body, but they will produce in that individual what God uses the term animalism which we don't want to be uh, involved with. So I must bring this body into subjection. That's the flesh. And you remember the spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh is warring against the spirit. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. So the quest for happiness you want to be happy. So many people are looking for happiness, but they're looking for it in the wrong place. Indulgence in eating, drinking, sleeping, or seeing. And I think now today we could include in that hearing, right? Everybody goes around with these buds in their ears. They're listening to all kinds of things. This is sin. And Satan has developed this programming 
of all humanity through all this technology and everything that's been developed. And it's not that it can't be used for a good purpose as well. I'm not denying that. But the majority are not using it for that good purpose. They are allowing the enemy to enter into their body temple through the avenues of the soul, um, the eating, drinking, seeing, sleeping, and so forth. So the harmonious the actions of all the powers of body and mind results in happiness. Now that's harmony, and that's what God wants in these bodies. That's what he wants in the church, is harmonious action, okay? All working together, one plan, his plan, one purpose, his purpose for the salvation of this world. And while we do want to come into a perfect unity, and God is going to bring that, it is unity only in one thing, and that's God's truth. It's not going to be unity in a lie or in a specious teaching. It's going to be unity, everyone realizing this is the truth, this is what I want, and they'll all because of God's drawing, will draw them through that one channel of truth. And thy word is truth. The more elevated, the more refined the powers, the more pure and unalloyed the happiness of that individual. Temperance in all things has more to do with our restoration to Eden than men realize. There it is, that temperance in all things. So we are headed back home. That's where we want to be. God's going to restore us to that original school, if you would, the Eden life, the garden life. And um, this is one of the ways that he will do this as he is working in us through law. Now, here you'll find that, this is in councils and diets and foods, the transgression of physical law is the transgression of God's law. Our creator is Jesus. He's the author of being. He has created the human structure. He's the author of physical laws as he is the author of the moral law, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And the human being who is careless and reckless of the habits and practices that concern his physical life and health sins against God. Now again, you'll remember that God will not come back to this earth and allow the results of transgression to be punished without first giving a person an opportunity to know the truth. So he can choose, right? In other words, in the times of our ignorance, we're told, God winks at. But now he is calling upon all men to repent. So we need to understand, and a lot of people, you hear it say, oh, the health message, what is that? I mean, if you want to feel good, that's fine, but it has nothing to do with the spiritual nature. And brothers and sisters, I hope we can see from God's word, it has everything to do with the spiritual nature of man. And it says, you know, you hear people, you're not saved by what you eat. No, and we're not saved by keeping the commandments. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But once being saved, we're going to keep God's law because we love him, both spiritual and the moral law. The human being who is careless and reckless sins against God. Man's duty, 1 Corinthians six nineteen. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, for both are God's. So nothing we have belongs to us. We've had that in our Sabbath school lesson, right? We are stewards, and that's all. And if we prove ourselves an unfaithful steward in this body, do you think God's going to give us new bodies so we can repeat that? It's not going to happen. And that's why we are in a testing time now. How are you going to handle what doesn't belong to you? If God's going to give you a new one, then you've got to show yourself able to care for that which is not ours anyway. 
Um, and then this is in 1 Corinthians 3. It's a little bit more forcible here. Know you not that you are the temple of God. Spirit of God dwells in you. And if any man defiles this temple, which is holy, God shall destroy. And it's not, and I want to add this so you don't get the idea that, that Satan would like us to get, well, God's just up there just waiting to, you know, destroy us. Another statement you may recall is God destroys no one. We destroy ourselves by going contrary to the laws of life and health. So God's giving everyone a choice, but he first has to educate us because a lot of this we don't know. Um, and this is why God is saying, don't oppose the health message because I'm bringing it to the front because people need to understand the importance for their own personal life and the importance for the messages that must go to the world to deliver men from sin in every aspect of it. The present weight of suffering and anguish which we see everywhere, the deformity, the decrepitude, the disease, the imbecility that is now flooding this world make it in comparison to what it might be and what God designed that it should be, it is in contrast a laser house, a house of sickness, disease, and suffering. And you see where the world is. And as a physician, I see this more and more every day. And it's just so heart-wrenching. Young people now coming in with all these, not just physical disease alone, but all the, the spiritual disorders of the mind and they're miserable people and they're looking for help and they don't know where to go. And they think, well, then they're going to go to counseling and they're going to go to a psychiatrist and he's going to give me a pill and that's going to make everything better. But that's all a delusion of the enemy. There has to be a reordering of this mind and only the Spirit of God can do that. Results of transgression and perverted appetites. This present generation are feeble in mental, moral, and physical power. And all this misery has accumulated from generation to generation because fallen man will break the law of God. Sins of the greatest magnitude are committed through the indulgence of a perverted appetite. Can you imagine that? Sins of the greatest magnitudes, all these crimes, the killing, the destruction, because men are defiling their bodies and thereby changing their minds into these kinds of corrupt minds that are committing all kinds of um, sins before God and uh, to their fellow men. Um, and so this is something that God is wanting us to appreciate and to work with him to change. And aren't you glad that the good news is, is that God has come to deliver us from this? Okay, we don't have to be enslaved to appetites, passions, anything. Jesus came as a savior and he wants to reorder every aspect of this body because it is the temple. And the mind is the citadel of the temple. Jesus' prophetic de depiction of the world just before he comes again, just as it was in the time of Noah and as it was in the time of Sodom. And you can see it everywhere. That's one of the signs that we know that Jesus' coming is soon. In the days of Noah, they ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them. Now you'll notice there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and marrying if it's God's plan, okay, for two individuals to unite their lives. Nothing wrong with that. But this was all they were thinking about. In other words, they had put God out of their reckoning and they were living for the present and that was it. And this is where the world largely is today. Um, God is not in their reckoning. Same thing in the time of Lot as it was in the days. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Going on with life as usual with no thought of God in their mind. But the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire 
and brimstone from heaven, and it destroyed them all. And that will be the way it is. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed in the clouds of heaven. It is not going to be a day of rejoicing for this world. It's a day of darkness, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, because men then wake up to the reality that they're lost, the summer is past, the harvest is over, and we are not saved. That's one of the saddest verses in the Bible for me. And that's why we today have a work that God wants us to do, and he's privileged us to try to save as many as we can from this deluge that has come upon the world now of sin and suffering, sickness and disease. Christ declares that the condition of the world will be as it was in the days before the flood and as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Every imagination of the thoughts of the heart will be evil continually. On the very verge of that fearful time we are now living. Can you imagine when people are walking around, younger people, older people, it doesn't matter, what are, they, what are they thinking about? What are they listening to? They won't hardly talk to anybody anymore. They got these things in their ears. They're listening. You go to the airports, and I do fly a little bit, and you see families with small children, and they're all there. Father is on something, the mother is on something, and the kids are on their little tablets, okay? There's no communication. There's no talking. There's, there's no exchange of life for life anymore. Those days Satan has really kind of done away with and we are now programming ourselves for destruction. And that's what's happening to this world. And they don't realize it. They don't understand that. We're not holding them accountable. We want to help them to see something better that God has for them. To us should come home the lesson of the Savior's fast. Only by the inexpressible anguish which Christ endured can we estimate the evil of unrestrained indulgence. And his example declares that our only hope of eternal life is through bringing the appetites and the passions into subjection to the will of God. And can we do it? With Christ. We must do it if we want to be among those that will herald the Savior's coming. Uh, and it's not bad news, brothers and sisters. It's good news. We don't want to be in bondage to these things. We want to be free. Christ came to set the captive free, right? To open the prison house. And that's what he's trying to do in our lives and in the <coughs> lives of the people of this world. Remember, there was nothing that Jesus hated in this world but sin. He loved the sinner, but he hated the sin that was destroying him. And that's the way we must be, right? And he's going to make us that way. So knowing this, what will be Satan's strategy? He's always trying to counter God, right? Every time that God is trying to work for a soul and bringing it out of Satan's territory, Satan is trying to keep him enslaved. What will he be doing? Through intemperance, Satan works to destroy the mental and the moral powers that God gave to man as a priceless endowment. And thus it becomes impossible for men to appreciate things of eternal worth. Through sensual indulgence, Satan seeks to blot from the soul every trace of the likeness to God. Now, let me see. Yeah, the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to their appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptations to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. And so 
Are we just to look at the difficulties and the temptations? No. Because you remember, we're to look to the Savior's fast for us. He did it for us. And he said, all of this I've gone through so that you can have the power to overcome anything and everything that Satan will try to bring into your life. And that is good news. And as we are now here in the last days and we are challenged by all of this that's going on in the world, God says, don't take your eyes off of me for a moment. You keep looking to Jesus. Let him be the topic of your your conversations. We're not complaining about all that's going on in the world. We know the world's headed for destruction. Lift me up before men and women. That's the answer, is getting men and women to look to the Savior who wants to establish with them a, an intimate, loving, personal relationship and to free them from every tie that they have been bound to Satan's car. He wants it all dissolved so they can follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So his agenda. Those who have had light upon the subjects of eating and dressing with simplicity and obedience to both physical and moral laws, but who turn from the light which points out their duty will shun duty in other things. Now follow what's happening here. They have had the light presented to them on these physical laws, okay? Eating, dressing with simplicity, you know, temperance and all things. And if they blunt their consciences to avoid the cross that they will have to take up in order to be in harmony with natural law, they will, in order to shun reproach, violate the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And that's what Satan is driving this world to right now. And this is why the temperance aspect is so important. Jesus was temperate in everything, and God wants us to be the same. And a lot of people, they want to disconnect this. It doesn't make any difference what you eat, drink, or whatever. And God says, no, that's not true. It makes every difference in the world. That's why I'm trying to help my people to understand this so that they can explain it in a loving, kind way, but liberate people from this lust of the flesh and the lower passions. This has to be overcome by the power of God's grace. Then we are set free. There are many even among Sabbath keepers in who are, who are, that was in blank, the term wasn't given there, wherever that was, who are more firmly wedded to worldly fashions and lust than they are to healthy bodies, sound minds, or sanctified hearts. Conformity to the world is gaining ground among God's people who profess to be pilgrims and strangers waiting and watching for the Lord's appearing. So the great question then is, whose side will we be on in this great controversy? We talked about how God is calling us this morning, and it's a beautiful call. He wants us to come out and be separate. Leave these things. This is the old carnal lust, the carnal man, the carnal nature. We must get victory there, and God will give it to us if we're asking. Now, you remember we talked a little bit about in Sabbath school this morning about character. You remember Satan is trying to stamp his character upon every human being, and yet God is wanting us to develop a character that is like his, and that doesn't happen overnight. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. We're on the road. But character is not a gift. We talked about that. It is earned by stern battles with that old man, okay? That self-nature. And God wants us to get victory over that old man. And we have to die in Christ or we will die ourselves eternally. We've got a choice. We can either die to that old nature in Christ and live forever the Christ life, 
or we can continue in the old man, the carnal man, and the sinful man, and sin has got to be put away forever from this universe. Because when we are transgressing God's laws, whether it be the physical law, the moral law, we are bringing upon not only ourselves, but upon this world and upon the universe discord, disharmony, ruin, and that's why God has to put it away forever because it's affecting every being in this whole creation. Sin is going to be forever extinct and it won't rise up again because everyone will see what sin has done to humanity. And so we have the privilege of working with God first for ourselves and letting God cleanse us from that, putting to death the old man. And it's, he says now, let every breath be a prayer. Every breath. Because we're coming into conflict with this enemy every moment that we live from day to day, right? And we have to be in connection with Jesus to give all this when we're under temptation. No, Lord, give me more of your power to resist. Let me put this away. I'm giving it to Jesus, and he will give us then what in return? His life, okay, with perfect power over all the power of the enemy. So whose side am I on in this great controversy? And God says, examine yourselves. See whether you are really in the faith. The faith that works by love and does what? It purifies the soul. Mind, body, spirit. Remember how Paul said that? I pray your whole body, mind, spirit be what? Sanctified, okay? It's the whole man. And he doesn't want to leave in us one vestige of that sin nature. It's got to be put to death. In the battle for eternal life, we either will overcome or we will be overcome. Um, so we have the option. We can overcome. In fact, isn't that what Jesus said in Revelation 3? At the end, the promise. He that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my Father's throne. There it is, the overcoming. And if we're not overcoming, then we are being overcome. And that's what God doesn't want for any of us. He wants to liberate us, to free us. So how do we gain the victory? And millions are asking the question, what then must I do to be saved? Is that a fair question? So many are asking it. And it's not hard. The answer is simple. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God which gives us the victory. He's given it. It's not that we have to go out and do something for it. By faith, we can claim that victory. And if God gives us something and he commands it, then we can demand it. That's what he says. All of this faith is awaiting your demand and your reception. Now, that's, I used to think, Lord, that's kind of irreverent to demand something of God. And I said, how, how can I understand that? And at least what he shared with me, if I have commanded it, you can demand it. Okay? I've promised you this. It's yours for the asking, the receiving, and then for the uh, believing and acting upon it. He gives us the victory through Jesus. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I've had the privilege in more than a few occasions to work with people who are struggling under the bond of their appetites, passions, lust, whatever it is. And um, there, I don't know if you've, you, you may have known individuals, you may have been there yourself, but so often there is this idea that is placed in the minds of people that, okay, 
we have failed repeatedly. We have stumbled. We've fallen. But tomorrow, I'm really going to get after this, okay? And yes, um, I know what I need to do, but the kids are coming in, you know, from out of town, and they don't, you know, they don't know all of these things, and they're used to eating a certain way, and so naturally I have to, I have to be that way, right? Because I don't want to, you know, upset the kids. And our, you know, a holiday's coming. And, you know, the list, you just go on down. I've heard it. I've heard it all, I think. Why they can't do it today. And yet the Bible says, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. And I was just reading, and it really, it, it impressed me, is that what we don't overcome today, we add to the burden of tomorrow. And we get weaker, not stronger. So it's today that we need to go to war, okay, with Jesus. We have no strength of our own, but we need to take hold of him, our strong arm, and we need not to let go, just like Jacob. I'm not going to let you go. I'm getting victory over this thing, whatever that thing is. I don't want to be in bondage to anything anymore, except I want to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is part of the preparation, okay? For these end times, get ready, get ready, get ready. So, if we are to be unmovable, and we talked about that spiritually, we are being settled into the truth so that we can't be moved. This is part of God's truth that we are going to have to settle into. Sin in any fashion, whether it's transgression of natural law, physical laws, are the moral law is sin, and we are to be liberated from all of this. And so Philippians, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, this is Paul, but, how, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, okay, work it out. And that's what we're talking about in the character development. God has given us the means. He's given us the power. He's given us the understanding, the mindset, but he will not do the work for us. He won't do it. He's going to allow us to take the things that he has given us, a mind, physical strength, and we're to go to war with this old man. I'll give an example. How many here like to garden? Okay. Now, I'm sure that you don't do this, but if you were to tell somebody you were going to teach them how to garden, okay? All right, well, pick out your plot of land, you know, rope it off, you know, everything. And then you go out there, and every day you pray over this garden, okay? And, you know, you tell God where you want your potatoes and your tomatoes and your okra and your beans. You know, you plot it all out, and you go pray about it. Okay, Lord, you're all powerful, all right? I, I, I want you to do this for me, and I'd like to see it overnight because I really enjoy this food. So I'm going to go pray about this, and I'm not going to cease praying till the next morning. So I prayed all night, and I'm expecting to go out there, and I'm going to see all this beautiful crop of food. And you go out there, and what do you see? Nothing, <laughs> okay? There is a work that God has given to us to do, and we can do it with him, and he, but he won't do it without us, okay? He wants our cooperation. He's given us strength, power, a mind, and he wants us to use that in connection with him. We can't separate from him because that's where all of this is coming from, these free gifts, but then we have to work. And that's, if you've ever read this, about this overcoming. If Jesus did all the overcoming for us and no one ever did anything else, there'd be no character development, okay? These are free choices that we must make and then work with God in overcoming these things because we have worked with the enemy many years of our life to tear down this body. And now God is giving us an opportunity in Jesus to work with him to build it back. And that's the work now of restoration. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and do, of his good pleasure. 
as you are working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I hope that everybody's understanding that. It's not that we can do anything without God. It's not that. But with Him, we can do all things, and He wants us to work with Him to exert mental power as well as physical strength in order to accomplish the work that we're doing. And that's really, most people in the world understand that. If I want a good running car, I have to either take it into somebody who's learned how to repair cars. And I, I just usually don't just open the hood and go pray over it. There's something wrong. And we've got to find out the problem and then get it fixed. And people are learning how to repair that, how to grow food. They're, God wants us to be learning these practical matters as well. Every day we're told that we should be learning new things to enable our, us to help others, to be a blessing to this world, and that includes the practical matters of life as well as the spiritual. Okay? In our own strength, it is impossible for us to deny the clamors of our fallen nature. And through this channel, Satan will bring temptations upon us. Christ knew that the enemy would come to every human being and take advantage of hereditary weakness and by his false insinuations to ensnare all of those whose trust is not in God. By passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. It is not his will that we should be placed at a disadvantage in the conflict with Satan, and he wouldn't have us intimidated and discouraged by the assaults of the serpent. No. He says, be of good cheer. I've overcome this world for you. And a lot of times you recall that God is trying to help us to remember, don't keep talking about the power of Satan. We need to know his, his cunning devices so we can, you know, maneuver through them. But we need to be magnifying the power of Christ who has already overcome the enemy. And if we didn't have the angels, okay, and their protection, and we didn't have the Spirit of God on the ground now working with us, we'd have every reason in the world to just close up shop and go hide under the covers because we haven't got the wisdom nor the strength, the power to overcome anything. But Jesus has done it for us. And now he wants us to work with him using the wisdom that he will give us, the strength, the power, and he wants us to be cheerful, hopeful, and not talking to ourselves or to others. When we, it deepens the impression on our own minds. So we need to ask the Lord, help me be careful what I speak, that it is only faith and love and power and might and good things not dwelling on all of this that's going on right now. We are not to be intimidated by the assaults of the enemy. Let him who is struggling against the power of appetite look to the Savior in the wilderness of temptation. See him in his agony upon the cross as he exclaimed, I thirst. He has endured all that it is possible for us to bear and his victory is ours. What is it? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will never allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, right? And with every temptation, he will give us a way of escape that we need not be overcome. And if we are overcome, like John writing to the church, little children, I'm writing these things to you that you sin not. He doesn't want us continuing in sin. But, and if you sin, you still have an advocate with the Father. Christ Jesus the righteous. Go back. And we are told that our past and our mistakes can be stepping stones for higher ground if we will learn from our mistakes. Not to depend upon anything of us anymore. Our, our supposed wisdom or strength or whatever it is we think we have. No. We're depending solely upon Christ Jesus and that which he will give to us. And so don't become discouraged and we should be very careful how we're dealing with those who have <clears throat> a 
let's say, unknowingly continued in this ditch of sinning, repenting, sinning, repenting, and procrastinating, thinking tomorrow I'm going to do better. Okay? We need to be very cautious how we're dealing with them and be as kind and gentle and patient with them as God has been with us, right? And it has taken us years to get to where we are in our Christian experience. And we're told that we should not think others can be where we have been brought overnight. It's not going to happen, okay? But they will have to learn in a very short time what it has taken us years to learn, and they will learn it because of the power of the Holy Spirit that's being poured out without measure now upon those that are asking for it and seeking for it. Jesus rested. I love that word. Sabbath is a rest, right? And you remember there is a rest that remains for the people of God. Remember that in Hebrews. Okay. And the rest comes through a faith that will take hold upon the promises. Okay. We're resting in what God has promised to do and will do if we will just accept it and work with him. And so that rest that remains is a rest from sin. You remember Revelation 14? The wicked know no peace day or night. They don't have that rest that God wants us to have because they're still in sin. But when we overcome, there is peace, there is rest. We are free now from this tyranny of this horrible, cruel creature that has been driving us all of these years for, from a fear of death. That's Hebrews 2. We've been in bondage all these years because of a fear of death. And God says, I've come to destroy him who had the power of death. That is Satan. That's the devil. We've already passed from death to life in the Savior. We've already done that. So for us, we may sleep, but it's not death. The, this is from the scriptures now, from Isaiah, how Jesus rested in, in his heavenly Father. He says, the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. I know that I shall not be ashamed. Behold, the Lord God will help me. And then he points to his own example, and he says to us, who among you that feareth the Lord walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord, stay himself upon his God, and then he will have that victory. Just like Jacob did, you know, his stay was on the Lord. I'm not going to let you go. And that should be our attitude. And that's not irreverent. God wants us to recognize that there will be severe struggles ahead for every one of his people. But if we can remember that Christ already went through that for us, he's got the victory for us, and he's just asking, come to me. Don't take your mind off of me for a moment. You remember in the little book, Steps to Christ, you may have read it, that Satan will try everything that he possibly can to get our mind off of Christ. He's going to get us to look at several things. You remember what they are? What? All right, the faults of others. You ever do that? You ever catch yourself doing that? Boy, I'm glad I'm not like that person. We've all done it, okay? And God says, no, you can't have that anymore. You get rid of that, okay? You're no judge. You're not to be critical of anyone. Love thinks no evil, right? Okay, get rid of that stuff. Don't let that be in your mind, okay? What else? Your own faults. Oh, I tell you, how could God work with me? You, you, don't, you don't know. You don't know all that I've done. And God is saying, you don't know how bad you are. But I came into this world to save sinners just like you. And like Paul said, I've got to enter the kingdom of heaven as the chief of sinners. Okay? That's who I am. But I'm saved by grace. 
and God's grace is sufficient for the worst of sinners. So no, you don't just keep looking at your own faults. Now examine yourself, and if you do have one, bring it to Jesus. Talk to Jesus about this. I want to overcome this. Give this. I'm giving this to you. And now you give me the power to overcome this, and I'm not making any excuses. No, I'm a sinner. But you came to save me, and you have the power to do that. What's the third thing? The pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, this tastes good. This looks good. That's what the first fruit that we fell on, right? Look good for food, you know? This tastes wonderful. I've had people that I've been working with in health reformation, you know, they'll be wedded to certain things, you know, and I remember this one little lady, she, well, I'm not going to go into all that, but anyway, she said, I just love this thing. I said, oh, really? You know, she went on and she described you know, what pleasure it was for her life and contrary to the will of God, and she went on and on. I said, wait a minute, just, just one second, please, ma'am. I said, do you love Jesus? Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Well, do you love this thing more than you love Jesus? She thought about it. I said, Jesus is never going to ask you to give up anything except those things that are going to hurt you. Now, you think about that and you pray about it. Because Jesus said, if you love anything more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. So she was going to think about it. I haven't seen her since, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> but no, we don't want to be among those that are making these kinds of statements. The sins of the world, if there weren't pleasure in them, people wouldn't do them, right? So there's pleasure in sin for a season, and we don't want to go there. We've been there already. We've eaten of that forbidden fruit, and we want to be done with that. Okay? We eat for strength, not gluttony. All right? And what's the fourth thing? Anybody remember? The problems of the world. The sorrows, you know. All of these horrible things that are coming upon the world. And we talk about it, and what kind of effect does that have on us? It's not encouraging us at all. But then when we see these things, and we should be, I mean, for people that are going through difficulties, yes, we need to be right there with them, laughing, you know, if they laugh, you know, crying with them and their sorrows. We're not, no, we're to be compassionate people, but we're there for a purpose, and that is to show them a better way, something better. And we should be compassionate, loving, kind. We should be the representatives of Jesus, just like he did. He would sympathize with people. He would show an interest in their interests. He would mingle with them. That's fine. But we and ourselves are not concentrating our minds on the sorrows of this world, because this world is soon going to be put away. God wants us to focus, to talk about, to pray over the future of people, which is glorious, okay? And don't cloud others with the darkness that comes into our to others, oh, this is terrible, this is awful. Can you do something? All the time, God says, right beside you stands the divine counselor who is asking you to come to him and present all your difficulties, all of your problems, and he will show you the way out. And it, that does not mean that we don't counsel together. That's not what we're talking about either. We're told that in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. But this is far as we're coming together to do the work that God has given us. It's not for our necessarily our personal struggles, although there is a place even for that. But we're, as a good counselor, we are, as soon as we can, we're trying to transfer their dependence away from us upon the Lord, okay? That's a good counselor, okay? Because no mind is to be under the, the dominion of another mind. That's not God's plan. So, how did the Father strengthen His Son? You know, He says, the Lord God will help me. How did He do it? by giving him his own wisdom and his strength. 
How? From what source? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and he has found nothing in me. There was nothing in Christ that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin, not even by a thought did he yield to temptation, and so it may be with us. So if a thought comes in that you know is sinful, what do you do? Take it to Jesus right then. Lord, take this. I'm under temptation now. I need you. You send me, you know, your strength. Every angel in heaven, you said you would send to those struggling with sin. And don't just grit and bear it and try to, oh, I've got to overcome this. Pray without ceasing. Call upon Jesus when you need him. Get this out of my mind because Satan is trying to put it in your mind. Okay? And the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, you know, give that to the Lord as soon as it comes and you ask God to keep you focused upon Him who is everything to us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and He came to make us partakers of that same divine nature. And so everything, you remember, He did not exercise any prerogative of the Godhead except what we can, we can uh, depend on. Um, he was fully God, fully man, but he restrained from using those things uh, just of the divine nature because he overcame as we have to overcome, utilizing what God will give us by the Holy Spirit's power. Okay? And you remember that is how he accomplished all of his miracles. You've read that. Jesus, by the Holy Spirit and the angels and the word, okay? All of that, and that's what we have today that we can overcome in the same way. And what is it? And God is gonna demonstrate this. We will be the vindication of God to this last generation to show that God can do what he said. The argument is that human beings cannot obey the law of God. And he will demonstrate through his called, chosen, and faithful ones, that's a lie. Here they are, okay? They have given their sinful nature over to me, and I have given them the nature of Christ, my nature, and humanity, when it is linked with divinity, does not sin, period. And by what means did he overcome? By the word of God. Only by the word could Christ resist temptation. It is written, he said, and to us are given exceeding and great precious promises that by these you might be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now how long will you be in this flesh nature? How long? Or Jesus comes, right? And then we're changed in a moment, or when we're resurrected. So you can see this doctrine of holy flesh. You can see how that's absurd. We don't have holy flesh. We've got sinful flesh. And we're going to war against this as long as Satan lives, and we're in this body. But just as Jesus did, he overcame it, and we can too, by the power of the Spirit of the living God who has overcome it for us. So no, we don't have holy flesh. We've got sinful flesh and we have to be on guard every moment. When assailed by temptation, don't look to the circumstances. Don't look to your own human weakness but to the power that's in the Word of God. All of its strength is yours. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
By the words of thy lips I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. And that's all Jesus would do is quote scripture. It is written. And that's why God says only those who have fortified their minds with the word of God will make it through these last days and be able to be triumphant. It is the word that will liberate us and free us and give us that love that must be in our hearts for others. So God's gifts of love to his children living amid the perils of the last days. Gifts of love, what are they? Well, we know about the latter rain, right? It's coming. In fact, even back some years ago, the showers were starting to fall. And I, I trust that you know that the latter rain is falling right now. It's not in its maximum power by any means, but the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this world now. You know that. At the same time, the Spirit of God is being poured out in greater and greater and greater measure to those that are what? Asking for it, realizing their need, praying for it. And every day that prayer should go forward from unfeigned lips, more of your spirit, God. Please give me more. And then the testimony of his spirit, all right? A lot of people say, we don't need that. We got the Bible. If we didn't need it, it wouldn't have been given to us. We're not studying our Bibles as we should. And so to make sure that man has no excuse for failure, we have the other testimonies that have been written. And you know, that's not new. Do you remember Moses in the days when he was leading the children out of Israel? There was the testimonies then. You remember that. You had the Ten Commandments in the ark, right? And what was in the side of the ark? Moses' writings. Okay, He was a prophet. So it's no different. This isn't anything new that God has sent prophets to help us along the way. So we want to avail ourselves of everything and to use what we need to. But what about the health message? Is that a gift? It's a gift of God's love. And it says that through this, we will then be enabled to overcome the... the power of the flesh nature, okay? And Satan is doing his best to work through it. Now you can see this, and I'm sure you've, you already know it. You look at all this fast foods that have come recently, you know, in the last few years, you know, terrible things, okay, that people are trying to subsist off of. You see the change in the music that appeals to the carnality of man. Okay, to the sensual nature of man. Uh, now all the new technology that's available. Can we not see what Satan is doing? And can we not understand how God is trying to counter all this by the power of the Spirit working through the Word of God? And so that's what Satan is doing. He's trying to divert the mind from the Word, which is the only power that man can have in this life, okay, through the Spirit. We haven't got time for God anymore. I've got to go see this movie or this show. I've got to get on the internet. I've got to watch this. I've got to do this work. And so we are being enslaved, brothers and sisters, by Satan and this world when God says, you need to come out of this world. That's what the message is. Come out of her, my people that you're not going to be partakers of her sins. Oh, well, I'm not, I'm not a member of Babylon, you know. Be careful, all of us, if we think we stand, okay? Be careful, take heed lest you fall. So none of us are <coughs> safe from the enemy's deceptions, power, persuasion, 
Afflictions? No. And the only defense that we have is God in these last days and the gifts that He has given us. And the health reform message, if we didn't need it, God wouldn't have given it to us. But it points out those things that will destroy the body and then have its negative effect on the mind. It was in love that our Heavenly Father sent the light of health reform to guard us against the evils that result from unrestrained indulgence of appetite. And he who cherishes the light which God has given him upon health reform has an important aid in the work of becoming sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. God says then we, that we can make it impossible for the Holy Spirit to sanctify us if we are indulging in these sinful, fleshy lusts because they destroy the power of the mind to appreciate sacred truth. Isn't that something? And so we can make it impossible for God to do this. But on the other hand, God says, no, don't do that. Come to me. And I'm going to make it possible for you to overcome everything. The health reform is one branch of the great work that is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is to the body. The hand needs a body, right? And the body needs a hand, okay? And this is not in any way to, in fact, God tells us the worst evil that could come upon this church is when men try to disconnect the health message and the health work from the ministerial uh, arm of our message, okay? The ministers. All of the health workers, physicians, other health care providers, all of this. We're all to be medical missionaries. We're told that ministers should become medical missionaries. They should learn how to treat sickness. We're all doing the same work. And we're all in one body. And we need everyone. We need our ministers. We need our health workers. We need our coal porters, the publishing work. We need all of this our schools, our educational systems, and we're to try our best to do everything that we can. Now, there's a, there's a little comment about this. God says it's too late to do all that we could have done had we followed God's counsel from the very beginning. It's too late. We don't have that time. But the sentence then begins with another sentence, but we can still do much, okay? And we can make every day now count for God, okay? As we're trying to do our best, working with God, we're not, I should be careful how I say that, working for God, we're working with God. We're not directing anything. We are asking God, what do you want me to do for you today? Okay, and then do it with all the power that he gives us and the cheer and the joy. And then we will have the assurance that God is not only with us, he's in us and is fitting us for immortality. A responsibility to spread the knowledge of hygienic principles should be felt by every man and woman who claims to be a Seventh-day Adventist and much more by those who are connected with our health institutions. That's in pamphlet 142. All should realize that this is an important part of the Lord's great work for the salvation of souls. So let it be the aim of all to be laborers together with God for the uplifting of humanity. And all should be educators both by precept and example. You remember when they sent the authorities, the Jewish leadership, they sent the authorities over to the temple to get Jesus and bring him back. 
they were going to proceed with their proceedings against him. And the guards went over there to the temple. They went into the temple and they heard him talk and speak. And they came back without Jesus. You remember that story? Yeah. You gotta read it. I forget what gospel it's in. But the leaders, they, when they saw these men coming back, well, well, where's Jesus? Why didn't you bring him back? We sent you over there. And he says, never man spake like this man. Amen. And it's because of that, the power of the word was endorsed by the Holy Spirit that was in him, bringing conviction. And that's why it says here that we should be educators, not just by precept, just by teaching and preaching and those things. They need to see the example, okay? And we need to be living the truth by the power of the truth in us, and then there is a power with us that will convince others. We can preach all day, and if the Holy Spirit's not there, it'll make no difference whatsoever, nothing. But if the Holy Spirit is there and the angels of God are with us, then we are living the truth because the truth is living out in us and there'll be power in the words that we speak. Does that make sense? So an essential key to victory in the Christian race. Temperance alone is the foundation of all the graces. There's the key that comes from God it's the foundation of all victories to be gained. It's really the beginning. It's not the end. <laughs> okay, we'll stop here. Do you have any questions or comments at all? Is this something everybody's known, they've understood, and we're all together now in this, right? We all need. That's what Paul says. I'm not going to fail to put you in remembrance of these things. <laughs> and we all do. We've read them, I'm sure, and everything, for me at least. I'll go back over these things, and I'm amazed. I've read that before, but I never understood that before. Haven't you had the same experience? And God's showing you. It's there all the time. It's not new. It's not new truth. But you remember how as we're digging into the Word, that new truth is going to be shown us. It's not apart from the scriptures, it's already there. But it's new truth for us because God is impressing on us these precious gems that we are digging for in the mind now uh, so that we can be effective workers in the Gospel Commission. Okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 201. Mm-hmm. 201. Yes, ma'am. Could you just um, mind stress again the, the role that we were playing that God plays in this world? Okay. All right. It's a good question. The role that we play. Now, I think it's, it needs to be understood. Apart from God, we have nothing. Okay? We can do nothing. Okay? But with Him, we can do all things. All right. Now, with Him. Now, we're connected. Okay? With Him. And he wants us, he says, get in the yoke. And what's a yoke for? To work together, okay? And my yoke is easy. It's not burdensome, okay? My burdens are light. But now I want you, as my daughter, my son, I want you to work with me. So there are going to be some things that I'm going to give you wisdom how to do. I'm going to be your counselor. You're going to have to use the mind that I gave you, though, okay? And I'm going to give you strength to do some things that are going to require effort, energy, strength. Even going out. We're going out tapping on doors. He's got to give us a spirit because a lot of us don't like to do that, right? And yet at the end, it says that they're going to be Christians, you know, with their Bible in their hands, going out. You know, they're lighted up, all right? They're knocking on doors, and they are straightforward. In fact, some of the statements, I tried this once, I'll tell you some of the experiences. We're to go to the people and tell them the end of all things is at hand. Are you ready? Can you imagine going up and knocking on somebody's door? Would you do that? Well, I did. And you'd be surprised. 
because I read it, I, I'm going to do it. And the people say, yeah, it, these things, and this was years ago. Boy, this world is getting terrible, okay? And you'd be surprised. There are people that are just waiting for us to come to them, okay? But it takes energy. It takes effort. It takes strength. And this is what the health message is all about, is so that God can pour this into us, okay? We can become so disabled by our habits of eating, drinking, dressing, that we're so enfeebled, even our minds aren't thinking clearly. And God cannot use us. So He wants to clear that channel, and He does it through the Word. And He tells us now, I'm telling you, and I'm not going to force you. I'll never compel anyone to do anything. But I'm going to tell you that I would like for you to put this thing away. It is interfering with my relationship with you. It may be an article of food. It may be an article of dress. It may be what we're reading or whatever. God, that's between you and, and the Lord. But he's going to convict you just like he did me. Something's wrong with you. And he wants to remove all of those things. And this is why every morning we should be asking God, search my heart. Try me. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And then we're giving God an invitation. Come and do this for me. And then when he shows us what it is, then we have a work to do. And that work is by the strength, the power, the grace of God, we need to put this away. Amen. That is the cross bearing, you know. Oh, you want to follow me? Well, there it is. Pick it up. Okay. D deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And that's, that's a death experience because it may be things that we've enjoyed for years and God's allowed it. But now in these end times, he's saying, you're going to have to give this up, okay? You can't continue with this. Or I want you to go out and knock on doors. Well, I'll pray about that, okay? No, we're going to go do it because God has asked me to. We may have to stand up and be accountable when maybe the majority which we're told is going to forsake us, we may have to stand for truth though the heavens fall. And that may be in the church. It may be out of the church. Wherever, when God wants us to speak, there's no sin as great as being silent in a time of emergency when God has us there to speak a word. And so those are things that are not maybe... I learned a new word today, Tom, counterintuitive. <laughs> Those things may not be something we feel so comfortable doing, and yet God's asked us to do it. And so it takes effort, okay? It takes a determination that I am going to do what God has asked me to do, but I'm going to do it in love. We're not there condemning anybody. But we, what we are doing is we're exposing error so people can see truth, okay? Jesus did that, didn't he? Yeah. And you know, a lot of times, well, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, so I'm not going to say anything, you know. And that sounds so good. And you remember that when one of our former uh, leaders uh, tried that, of watering down the message that God wanted that person to give, and then in a vision, she saw Jesus' face. And it wasn't nice. There was a frown there. No, I gave you the message. You deliver the message as I gave it to you. And that's why God says in these times, there can be no peace and safety message being brought to the church. That this is a time that the, the army has got to mobilize, okay? And to go forward in doing a work. And it is, it's a lovely work. I mean, it's, but it's going to take some things that we don't now have, but as we're asking for it, God's going to equip it, just like he did Jesus. And I really appreciated that, you know, and I, I didn't realize it when I was baptized, but, you know, for Jesus' memory, um, I mean, Jesus had the Holy Spirit all the time, right? I mean, from the time he came into this world. But for that special ministry that God was anointing him for, he was baptized and he was anointed with the Spirit at that time. And this is why we have to be anointed every day 
okay, with the Holy Spirit, and we have to have that baptism every day of repentance, okay? Every day we are going to have to bring to the Lord our sins. Lord, I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have thought that. We don't, it's not even what we've said. God, you know what I thought about.